So good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's complete guide to light and how not to do it with your iPhone. Excellent. <laughs> That's good light. What are you on about? Well, it's, it's a bit blown out, mate, in all fairness. Have you got a good reading on that? Or is it just a crap? It's Rembrandt now. It's there Rem you go. It's Rembrandt. Rembrandt. Per perfect. Excellent. Turn to the three quarter. Turn it around. There you go. So, there we go. We'll actually do... Um, oh, we definitely don't want to do that. So whoever I was FaceTiming then, I do apologize. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> right. They ring. Let me switch it off. Somebody's going to ring back, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> right. Before we get going, because there are quite a lot of people online with us now, so enough of the japes. Uh, Mark, complete guide to light. As always, we do a recap about what it's all been about, really, especially if we've got anybody new online with us. So a quick recap, please, on, on what it's all about and why we've been doing it. Uh, well, the best thing I can suggest to begin with, as far as the recap, is go and watch parts one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, obviously, uh, they're available now on the Academy. Um, the reason that we began to put the uh, Complete Guide to Light together as a, ser a series was that um, I'm not writing any books for a while, and I also want to put something together for the members as a kind of a, a, a just for them when they actually kind of join. So f physically, in October, we hope, you'll actually have a PDF of a complete guide to light based on everything that we're doing during the course of these sessions and things, really. So the, the main thing is that um, improve little bits one step at a time, bring a stru structure into the training, what we're all based around. And remember to get out there and practice, practice, practice. That's the key thing. So if you kind of use the Complete Guide to Light as your um, bounce board for ideas for going out and shooting with some flash this weekend, then get it into the next photo critique so we can kind of have a look at those images and just see how we can improve those just a little bit more. So the Complete Guide to Light is a series of webinars. I'm not sure if it's the very first time we've done it except for business. I can't remember another series, Jay of photography webinars where they've all rolled and they've all completed a, seri a series. Can you? Not as comprehensive of this. Probably we did a sh much smaller one with a clock and compass, a while, uh, but that's a oh, while ago course. now. But again, we're not nowhere near the structure. Well, we're at, uh, this is actually part eight today. So uh, part seven today, sorry, part eight before we have eight, a small. Uh, part eight today. Part eight today, I beg your pardon, sorry. And then, um, but we, again, a structure running us right through, as you said, till August on that. So, cool. Um, so the, the whole point was that we could actually bring um, a focus in onto things that are current. Obviously, some things we just kind of uh, pull from some of the films made on the Academy. I've done that again tonight, just so you can go away and watch them as well. So if you want to see it in practice, that's the key thing. Um, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer, and if you've seen me in demonstration or you've come on a workshop or Obviously, fingers crossed you've watched some of the films on the Academy. Um, but basically, everything that I shoot is straight out of camera as a rule. So you can see it in practice that if it doesn't look like it's in front of you, because I'm a film photographer at heart. I come from those film years. So it means I work on technique and a recipe that is repeatable each time. Once we get the basic part of the shoot done, then we can actually develop it into a little bit more of the creativity. But we should be able to nail the, the basic part of the shoot in a very short length of time so that we can then concentrate on the little bit of that kind of creative edge. Uh, Brill, well, while I give you the screen so we can get into tonight's presentation, guys, we want you to interact with us. So any questions you have for Mark, please pop them through the question panel and we'll ask them where appropriate. Or as always, we allow plenty of time for your questions. Mark, you should have the request to share your screen. Brill, <clears throat> okay. So um, flash on location tonight. So remember that we've covered... Um, continuous light, we've covered a little bit of daylight, we've talked about the speed light in two parts, we talked about photographing dance and using flash to actually record it, natural light and so on. We did the basics in the clock and compass at the beginning and so on and so on. So we're doing lots of little things, but today we're going back onto flash and location. So this is whether you're using speed light or using um, uh, little strobe lights, whatever it is, but we're, we're working on location. It could even be a flash that can connect into a mains power, but you're working in small spaces, in on location and so on and so on. Anyway, so um, tonight, again, we're looking at um, kind, of the, kind of the key elements, which we'll talk about now in a minute. But the first thing we've got to talk about when we're using flash on location, there's, there's three main reasons we would be using flash. Um, one of those reasons 
shouldn't be because it's on the speed light, it's on the camera, or it's switched on all the time. If that is uh, why you're using flash allocation, the first thing I'll encourage you to do is switch it off and start to actually look and understand the, um, uh, the kind of the use of the natural light and then actually decide on how you can use flash in the image. So the three main things that I teach when we're working with flash and location are, are we using flash to correct the ambient? So that might be a bit of bounce flash, um, a bit of direct flash for the likes of groups on a wedding or a big group for a presentation check in sunny days. Is it to help balance the ambience? So in other words, we want to bring some tonality. Um, so in other words, the bottom right-hand image here, the bride and groom. So in other words, I'm not sure if you see, but the auctioneer at the top, which we'll look at some of his photographs in a minute, and uh, his wedding shoot below, in fact, um, they're, they're kind of the same guy. Obviously, you can tell that. Um, but one is being used for um, creating a dynamic portrait for commercial re reasons and the other one is being used to obviously capture uh, the joy of the wedding day but the last thing I want to do is overpower the ambient at times with too much flash so in other words um, just using it for no reason at all <clears throat> when we talked about flash in the past one of the things that I talk about quite a lot is making the flash big making the flash soft or making the flash small. So in other words, I'm either gonna try and make it get big, yeah, straight away, bounce it off a white wall um, to kind of create a, a bigger explosion, bouncing it off a bounce card, you know, on top of the flash, if that's what we use, we're using, to make it go bigger, but also in the direction that we want it to be. Then I want it to go soft, so a softness would be you uh, using it through bouncing off a white umbrella and bouncing back into the scene shooting it through a small soft soft box to create a soft but more directional light source. And then of course we look at the more uh, kind of dynamic images where we're overpowering the, am the ambient, whether it's with small flash or big flash, to really kind of make the subject stand out from its natural environment because we're killing a lot of the, am um, uh, the ambient within the scene. So the first thing to actually learn from tonight is why are we using a flash and how are you gonna make that decision when you're on location? It's a, a kind of a quick thing that you need to actually think about in as far as your style management is concerned. So when we start to look at the use of flash, <coughs> simple speed light here, um, both working with the am ambient light, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, both working with the, ab the ambient light, but you can see from these two images that when we're using flash and the am ambient light um, uh, together, if the ambient light equals the flash, then pretty much the flash becomes non-evident within the scene, except for in the catch light of the eye, or a different style or shape to the soft shadow that is created um, somewhere within the photograph. It could be behind them, it could be from a collar, a cuff, whatever it be, and so on. So here on the left-hand side, a 60 to 4 is not only the ambient exposure, but it's also what we've set our flash up for, and then we've got that lovely kind of light. Now these are images straight out of camera, JPEG images, even though I'm shooting raw all the time. The image on the right hand side is where I'm basically shooting the speed light at 200th of a second at f4. Now the Canon by design only really likes to shoot in normal flash mode at 160th of a sec second before it starts to actually have the sync problem and you start to get a black line running down the edge. Um, but if you start to know your kit and perhaps you don't want to use the likes of high-speed sync where you're minimizing the amount of flash power you can capture in that, that time frame. Um, we can also fool the, cab the camera by either stepping backwards more so we can crop the image, we can crop the black off, um, or we can turn the camera upside down if we're shooting landscape images. So instead of having kind of black grass, we can put the gradient into the sky to create a darkness there. So this is kind of, um, the image on the left hand side is balance and the image on the right hand side is start, is starting to bring a little bit more dynamic. Um, again, you can see though that both of them are lacking a slight post production, uh, production fix. The image on the left hand side and the image on the right hand side both need a little bit of uh, levels adjustment with them and basically then they're done. 
if we truly want to overpower the ambient, we have to look at huge sources of light, or we have to start to use, if we're using speed, a speed light, high speed sync. And that allows us to capture the, um, uh, the image in front of us with just a small part of the flash. Now, e even some of the big flash com companies like Elinchrom now do portable packs where you can shoot at a higher sync with a special device to allow to capture more of the flash curve as you take the exposure. So when flash goes off, of course, remember there's a curve, there's an amount of flash. Now, as a rule of thumb, what the speed lights are designed to do or what exposed flash is designed to do is, cap is capture the biggest part of the flash, the curve, the biggest part of the curve. But when we start to use high speed sync, it starts to see a fraction of that curve. And that's why, obviously, the faster the shutter speed we go, the less the flash we see, and hence the, um, the less of the uh, exposure we're physically going to get. Okay, so as far as what we're looking for is overpowering the ambient light source to give really dynamic images. Okay, so what are the main things we want to look at when using flash and location? They're going to be metering, using the ambient light, we touched on that touch, setting up the flash to begin with to actually work in the way we want it to work, make the decisions whether we're going to work in man manual or TTL, and even um, some of the flash companies now, like Elinchrom, uh, create a TTL ver version. Creative color, how we're using uh, color within the scene and changing the color palette. Shutter speeds for effect, um, both high and slow. And then obviously lighting recipes for the session flow. So I've got kind of a, a couple of sessions at the end just to give you an, uh, an idea of the kind of variety. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if we're looking at this image to begin with and we're going, well, what do I meter for? There's different metering points to begin with. One of them could be for the exposure outside of the windows. So then I'm going to actually um, balance the whole room using uh, a th third party flash, as it were, to kind of bring the room al alive. If I uh, meter, as I've done on the left hand image, for the basically the detail over by the window. So what I'm looking at is the blue upright on the left hand side there's a cupboard right next door to it in fact i'm metering for detail here and then i'm going to be using my flash near camera and below to bring the scene alive on the right hand side so basically what we're seeing is the image on the left and the image on the right it has the same amount of ambient within the whole scene but then we're using small multiple flashes in certain locations to give illumination to bring the brightness and to control the eye in towards the scene. But the first thing remember is natural light before reflector, reflector before flash, flash is a last resort. But basically when there is not enough light in the right place, we've got to start to create and use flash pretty much the whole time. So when we're meet metering, the kind of the key things are to begin with, uh, begin with is um, are we trying to correct the ambient, balance the ambient, or overpower the ambient? All of those are done to do with shutter speed and aperture combined. Remember, the shutter speed is the only thing, realistically, that once an aperture is set, will bring more drama or less drama to the natural light, because all the shutter speed is going to do is allow either less or more of the ambient light in towards the photograph. Once we, we get that, then it's using the equipment that we've got. Obviously, some of you will take a photograph, look at the back of the screen and say that's too bright. You'll go to your flash, you'll dial down some power, you'll take another photograph, you look on the back of the camera, basically make a decision from there. Perhaps you'll adjust again and again and again and again. But where is um, the pro uh, end <clears throat> and the, seri uh, the serious um, amateur? We'll always use a meter, a flash meter specifically, when we're using flash, because it helps us get the desired image exactly in the way that we want to do. So the first thing is dome in or dome out. So what, what we're seeing on both of these images, a round dome that covers the sensor. Can I remind you that the sensor should never be uncovered when you're taking an exposure, because that will give you a damage to the sensor eventually, as well as a false read, false reading. So it never gets uncovered. The dome, the dome gives us an average reading. So it allows not only for the highlight catching the one side, but it also allows to average out the shadow side. 
So with the flash meter um, 308S on the left, I would actually have to replace the dome with a flat disc that comes with it. And then that would only record for the light that hits the flat surface um, for where I point it towards the subject. So in other words, I point it towards the light source to actually meter for the flash falling on the face, whereas I'd meter probably down towards the gray floor um, of the ground to meter for the ambient light within the scene. OK, so uh, it's understanding. And with the Sekonic, um Lightmaster Pro that we're seeing on the right hand side, basically the dome dials backwards. So it dials flat as you turn the top dial within it. So now that we know that the dome in is for a more accurate flash and exposure reading, the dome out is given an average reading of the highlight and shadow, which means you might find there's a slight increase in the exposure, exposure by a fraction of a stop, perhaps a tenth, and you soon get used to that. Um, where do we face it? Well, we obviously face it towards the light source that we're trying to meter for. Which setting do I use? Well, basically, um, with the Sekonic, um, uh, all flash meters as such really you set it onto the little light uh, the lightning bolt sim symbol which is usually in the middle of the dial that's what you use to actually uh, um, set uh, for flash um, there are some other settings with the advanced meters like the lightmaster pro which allows me to even trigger my flashes from uh, a wireless kind of point of view from within the actual me uh, the meter itself if I want to fire my studio flash or my speed light flash from the meter itself when I press the button, I have to have it on the light, the lightning symbol and the little C, which stands for cord. At that point, we need to put either a cord or a trigger uh, linked into this little um, uh, device here at the, bot the bottom. And from there, it will actually send a, sig a sig signal to the flash to fire, and then it meters it itself. Okay, so if you were working alone, that's probably the quickest way, unless you've got a, a meter trigger. So I, sh I should say, start again. So unless you've got a flash trigger, that is, it can be in your hand, and then you can basically press the trigger to fire the flash. In that case, you can work with it on the standard light, uh, the light, uh, the lightning bolt position. Any questions so far, Jay? Uh, nothing specific, mate. No. Okay. So <clears throat> let's have a quick look at uh, the am uh, the ambient and how it is affected by shutter speed itself. So um, these, uh, as I showed you last week or whenever part seven was, uh, <clears throat> it's a blur now. Um, I was showing you some of the dancer images, and this is actually in the middle of a kind of a shopping street in in uh, Pontypridd, not far from our old studios. Um, but you can see the difference uh, with the image on the left and the right, whereas the shutter speed is being slowed down with the image on the left hand side to allow more of the ambient in the scene compared to the image on the right hand side. The shutter speed is being used so fast that basically um, it, it overrides most of the, am uh, the ambient light. Hence, we have a contrast image. Now, the image on the left hand side looks slightly brighter and overexposed because we've opened the flash up, sorry, we've opened the shutter speed up um, in an overexposed way to actually bring a lightness and almost a flare back from the sunlight coming towards us. So all that is being controlled is, is a shutter speed adjust, adjustment to change between the two images. <clears throat> so when I'm going into a scene like we are here, the first thing I want to do is measure the ambient light first. So what I would do is take a reading from uh, the, the light source within the scene. So if it was from above, I'd hold my, me uh, my meter in the standard sun mode yeah, on the dial and basically meter it for the av average reading within the scene. That's going give, to give me um, either the exposure to override or the exposure to um, um, uh, bring into the overall working am ambience of the image itself and things really. This, this guy, by the way, was a real character with all the, mem the memorabilia from all the wars and things. So the image on the left-hand side is giving us a reading of, say, a 15th at 4. Now I want to override 
the um, ambient light within the scene as well as bringing some clean light so in this case what I'm doing is uh, creating um, a flash power of at least one stop above but as you can see here it's quite a hard light source because it's creating a hard shadow behind him and to the left um, but what it's being used in it's not on camera it's off camera on a little stand to the right hand side so it doesn't over light the, fore uh, the foreground so the specific part to kind of acknowledge here is the bottom right hand corner of the image on the right hand side is is a, a, a bag or some cloth close to camera position if I was using flash on camera that would be illuminated and add a distraction to the eye so as a rule we always want to actually appear as if we're shooting through things to give a three-dimensional and more believable light now uh, what I've also done in fact is I've put another flash outside of the window to the left it looks like there's a lovely bit of light coming through the window there anyway it's not it's in a, um, a kind of a shopping uh, arcade uh, and everything else so basically what I'm doing is actually bringing some of the light through I put another flash there to bring some more illumination in and that would be set one stop less than the key light itself so this is where we're using the am ambient light and the flash together within the exposure the ambient is only just bringing a little bit of the detail of the shadow and a little bit of warmth in tone in the background whereas the flash is giving us our working exposure so when we're looking up set, uh, setting up the flash, the first thing I'll encourage you to do is where possible, get it off camera as soon as you can. All right. It's not all the time because obviously if you're a ring flash fan like I am, I need a flash on camera to create that kind of effect. Um, but as soon as you can start to take the flash off camera position, we, we, we get enabled to shape the light, control the light, increase it in size or control it in its size. When we then start to do the basic setup where we talked about this in the um, speed uh, the speed light series in session one and two, um, we started to talk about the trigger and the receivers to control uh, the lights. So what we've got to do is decide on whether the controllers we're going to use are just telling the flashes to fire or they're actually going to be used as a part of the exposure control. Now, um, the lights of the Yongnu and uh, I think Godox and other kind of co uh, the companies, the third party flashes, in other words, have really kind of begun, uh, uh, become cost effect effective to make speed light photography real fun and for you to have lots of different speed lights doing lots of different things within your shoot. But what we need to do is make sure um, that we're car uh, carrying uh, the right equipment for the job and that's really what we're going to cover kind of later on when we start to see the session uh, um, uh, kind of flow and things really so in the setting of the flash you just got to decide um, am I just wanting the camera trigger to just fire the flash and I will set the flash up man manually with a meter or am I looking to actually have it controlled in a TTL way in of some kind so when we're setting up the flash and putting the flash in a position, we've got to decide exactly what it's going to do. So if we're looking at the image on the left hand side, <clears throat> basically the image is all am ambient lit with the exception of I'm testing to see how much light I want to put onto the, ce the ceiling uh, behind and above him. So I'm using one light to actually light up the ceiling itself um, and then once that I've tested that, because that's going to be my separation light, I can decide on either more or less light. Um, the middle image is uh, where the speed light itself is being controlled, positioned, and height to make sure it gives me the correct exposure to override the ambient light within the scene. Now, as far as the height of the light, as well as the position of the light, so the first things first is that when we look at the clock and compass, the majority of the time you're going to either have your flash, uh, if, the sub, if the subject is in the middle of the dial and the camera is at the six o'clock, your majority of the time your flash is going to be on the four or the five o'clock position or between, okay? If you're having the light, as in this case, on the left-hand side, the light is going to be between the 7 and the 8 o'clock position. And it depends on how much strength and depth of shadow that you're decide, uh, deciding to have as far as the depth is concerned. 
Then when you combine those flashes together, and perhaps add in a third flash to create even more dynamic, as you can see here, the image on the left-hand side, again, without any flash on the face, but light on the ceiling, one flash is lighting the ceiling. In the second image, we can see the light hitting the face, yes? And then in the third image, we're seeing a light hit the ceiling, a light hitting the face, and a backlight to not only light the ceiling, but to also light the pillar and give a, a general increase in exposure for separation. In the same way, when we're looking to override the ambient light within the scene, the first thing I want to do is basically just light what I want to do. In this case, I'm using a speed light with a little honeycomb attachment on the front. In this case, I believe it's a Honol or a Lasterlight third version. But the first thing I need to do, though, is meter the sky behind him. And to do that, I'll do that through the camera lens, take a quick test shot. So in other words, if it read the likes of 125th at f8, and I want to override that sky to make it darker, I'm usually going to go a minimum of one stop and usually a maximum of two, of two stops. That is when I've actually uh, taken the exposure for the brightest point of the sky behind. It's obviously when we've got sunlight coming in from behind, then it would actually have to be you using the likes of high-speed sync so that we can maximize um, the, uh, the dramatic effect and things really. And as far as where the light position is now, um, Obviously, it's nice and easy for me to retouch that. But when we're first getting going, it's usually a good idea to actually use the likes of Assistant to see where the light's going to ac actually be, um, but then actually just put it on a pole um, so we can then start to have an easy retouching job during the course of the post-production. So manual versus TTL. Now, I've got to admit, I'm pretty much a fully manual man. When I'm shooting on location, uh, sorry, when I'm shooting the likes of a wedding and I'm using flash on camera as both to balance the ambient and to correct the ambient light, the flash is in TTL mode, but it's usually stopped down by around about a third. So in other words, I will set the camera up in a manual exposure and then I'll allow the flash itself to um, fire and then kind of knock itself off when it gets the desired exposure. In both of these scenes here, if I was using TTL, I would end up with pretty much an overexposed flesh tone. Um, but because I'm using manual flash expo exposure, I can control the whole tonality of the, high of the highlight itself. Why? Well, the first thing's first, that the image at the top, even though you would look at it with the horse and the rider or the girl, um, it's an even balance between the top and the, bo uh, the bottom. It is dominated by the shadow, the dark areas within it. So in fact, the, the flash things, I need to brighten this up more and it would overexpose the whole scene and hence we'd lose the effect. It, exactly the same in some way, but more exaggerated, the image below is that if the... Uh, camera was set on TTL, so the flash was set on TTL, there's a very good chance because the amount of darkness within the scene, um, it would actually overexpose the flesh tones actually on the face. So thinking about how we're positioning and what is in the scene is the first decision whether you're going to use TTL or a manual exposure, because if there is too much dark or too much light, the flash is going to start to think it either needs to overlight or underlight it. It doesn't know you're more intelligent than it is. So it will always try and override you. So try and take a real control on the image itself. So, for instance, there's a small little flash going off to like that red dress in the background. And if that was set in TTL mode, it would try and illuminate that fully to make the corner that is dark very bright instead of just in the way that I'm trying to create it. When we're using um, color and creative color with flash on location, there's several things that we can do. Obviously, like the image we're seeing here, I could use gel on the actual flash to change the color fully. But I can also use um, color uh, with flash in three, diff uh, three different ways. That is, color the flash itself in, with something like a gel or cloth. I could color 
uh, uh, sorry, use custom color balance on the camera, uh, the camera using the likes of a gray card or something in front of me that is a tone that I want to swap the color to. So in other words, if I put something light blue and I photograph the light blue and I custom balance from that, then obviously it would turn everything in the opposite of the color wheel so we get something uh, uh, more red uh, than anything else. Um, so in the post session processing, that's where we, we can either correct or completely kill it. So what are the main things? Daylight, auto white balance, flash, custom balance. So I would try and encourage you to use the daylight and the flash balance on camera and avoiding your auto white balance where possible because that's going to always try and correct the color within the scene. You don't, don't be afraid to start to play around with custom balances so that you can create the exact tone that you want to do. Uh, we use this a lot when we want to turn images more towards a blue tone um, or a warmer tone by just using the, Kel uh, the Kelvin correction or photographing something in the opposite color palette to custom balance from. When we're using color for effects, we want to uh, make sure that we're using stronger colors at times or correctional colors. So a stronger color gel will create dynamic color. Whereas a correction gel like a, C a CTO, a color temperature orange, will basically turn the white flash into a tungsten light. So it means that anything that is white light within the scene will now become blue. And then, of course, color effect is done from the stronger colors of gels or whatever we put in front of the white flash. But that's usually used for backgrounds or for separation rather than lighting the face. I do like a bit, bit of white light actually on the face for the majority of the shoot. So when we're looking at the color within the image, the image on the left, the left hand side, all we're doing is overriding the ambient light within the scene, but adding no color. But lit literally a stone's throw away from here is the big monolith that you see in, um, not Do Doctor Who, the other one, um, but because it, it's all filmed around Cardiff where we live. And um, basically um, the blue monolith here, the water coming down it, is basically, it's, it's chrome in fact, but what we're doing is using the ambient light in the scene and we're turning the ambient light in the scene to blue by using the color temperature orange uh, on the flash to light the sub uh, the subject and then swapping my color bands on camera into a tungsten mode. Hence, everything that is touched by natural or artificial white light now becomes blue. When we're setting up the flash by design, uh, I'll usually set up a two o'clock and a 10 o'clock separation light, whether I decide to use one or both of those, that's up, that's up to me. And then I'll also use a light near to camera to actually be my controller. Um, when I'm using light, um, I'm going to usually use a separation light. So in other words, uh, the image on the left hand side is a key light onto subject plus a separation light um, running on the right hand side to give some tone. Whereas the image on the right hand side is basically using the three lights and allowing the left light to flare in towards the lens itself to give us that extra dynamic. So um, I, I like flare for effect, but it can also kill the image. So be careful. Same monolith, just one is being used with the CTO gel on the main light to light the face. We've also using a gel on the separation light at the two o'clock position, but we're using no gel on the speed light at the 10 o'clock position. Hence, we've got the blue face running down the shadow area. Whereas the image on the right hand side is all lit with white light, uh, except we're using a slight warmth in the color balance to just boost it up just a little bit more. So creative color, position of the lighting, controlling the light and knowing how to quickly swap between um, the lights of the color effect using color temperature and being able to swap straight into um, a normal kind of looking image here. So in other words, just by switching off the color temperature, uh, sorry, the separation lights, uh, which are not being lit with gel, um, basically everything that is visible to camera that is lit with my flash is now in a normal color balance. 
okay? So understand the light, understand what it's gonna do, and then you can start to actually look at how you're using it for creative effect. Shutter speeds for effect, of course. We usually, when we're using the likes of smoke, I'm going to want it to actually drift and perhaps blur, that is if the model can stand still enough, as well as we can add the wind, um, natural kind of breeze to actually blow things. As long as the camera and the model can actually stay still, we can create it. But when we're using the shutter speeds for effect, again, when we're working inside, like the image on the left-hand side, we can use the shutter speed once more to either brighten or darken the interior of the church, of the studio here. When we're working on location like we are in the middle, we can use the shutter speed to match the ambient light within the sky or the scene to give a natural kind of balance throughout. And then obviously we can overpower the ambient light source or match a certain tone uh, with the image on the right hand side where we're controlling together and that's usually using high speed sync. When I'm setting the flash like I showed you before, the first thing I wanna do is look at the amount of amb ambient in the scene and then look at what every single light does. So in other words, the top left hand image is with a slight separation uh, light being allowed to spill onto him, but it's also real job is to actually illuminate the background. Then we're using a slight soft bounce light going off the ce uh, ceiling just to give an even illumination to the shadow in the whole scene. Then I'm putting in a the bottom left hand image, I've got that honeycomb gridded light again, just to bring the focus in onto the face. And when I combine all three lights of those together, we end up with the bottom right hand image, which is a combination of three lights. A three light setup is my favorite setup by design, um, but we'll, I'll use anything up to five or six, depends on the shoot. Okay, and by doing that then, we get good good dynamic separation. In this case, it's an editorial style of image. I get dynamic on the face, which brings the uh, viewer straight, uh, straight to his face. He's a, an Elvis impersonator, as well as a, a collector of ob object diary. He basically sells all this crap that every one of us is throwing away, but he puts value to it, and even I've bought stuff from him, <laughs> which is quite sad, really. Anyway. So when we're working in a scene, and by the way, these images that I'm just showing you now can all be viewed. If you go back and watch the editorial, uh, the editorial Apprentice series, you'll be able to see a lot of what we're showing you tonight actually in practice. Perhaps you can put some of the links out for that, Jay, please, yeah? So in the same way, if I've got a photograph a location like we are here, um, basically, the first thing I would recommend is you take a tripod along and not like me where you're doing it by hand. Um, but we need to actually see what each light is doing. Now, um, the way I use light is a bit like stage lighting. So in other words, I want to bring the viewer through to the point where I want the focus on. Now, obviously, this shocking red island here in the middle is the focus point of where I want to be. But I've also got to bring some illumination to the background to actually give some three dimensional depth using brightness and shadow as we're going along. So the image on the left hand side is looking at what the light is going to do um, for the se separation. So as it is, there's a speed light hidden behind this um, island and um, pointed upwards to actually bring the shape and shadow in. Um, at times, I'll use a uh, another speed light, in fact, just out of shot, so just hidden behind that white cupboard on the right-hand side. Hence, you, you can see that little bit of a shadow being caused on the wall behind. Then the secondary shot I need, I need to do is basically look at the illumination of the uh, the main fo focus, in this case, the island, as well as bring some illumination to the carpet. But the image uh, in, in the middle is where it's all balanced together. But you can see that uh, I need to actually bring more dynamic to the island and less dynamic to the background. So if you are using your speed light flashes in, in a ratio, this is where the flash that is illuminated, the eye island, would have more flash compared to the flash running in the background. So that's where you can use the ratios to actually up and down the power. So quick, quickly then, when we're in a position, we're usually going to use one light to light the subject and one light to light the scene in editorial. And similarly here, one light to light the subject, another light to light the background to give a three-dimensional element. So 
Remember the key is the setup of the flash. Where is it gonna go? Saw a few of these images last week. Once the flash is in position though, it'll allow you to actually then shoot in different kind of setups and looks and feels, and then you never have to move it again. Obviously, when you use an assistant with a light on a pole, there is gonna be a, a slight discrepancy in the distance between flash and subject. So making sure that the assistant can actually hold the light in the position for a length of time to generate the kind of the look and feel that we need. So let's quickly finish off then with some session flow. So this is a few images that I did uh, on demonstration at a theater at the I Festival a couple of years ago. So um, the first thing to do is obviously kind of go through the, ba uh, the basics. So flash on camera, pointing towards the subject, take it off camera, stick it on a, um, a stand, just give the kind of the basic illumination at the eight o'clock position, bounce card perhaps, or directional just onto her. Then move it to the three o'clock position, uh, point it directly at her, but allow some of the light to actually spill around and use a secondary light to start to separate her away from the background, as you can see on the hair and actually just running down the black leather of the sleeve. We take that then to the kind of development. Image on the left-hand side is with uh, no separation. The image in the middle is with perfect separation on the hair. The right-hand image is with too much light onto the hair and hence the, bur uh, the burning out. So as a rule of thumb, the separation light and the hair, the hair light is usually at least one stop below the working exposure from the main flash. Looking then actually using the small little soft boxes to create the dynamic, uh, create the shape and create even um, a, a whole kind of look and feel. You can see that image on the left-hand side because of this blacked out theater. I could have done this on location in the middle of the day if I could have raised my shutter speed high enough, of course. Um, but here we're using the shape of the soft box to create the dynamic. And this is a small little um, octobox uh, that goes on the front of the light. And then we start to actually look at creating the beauty within the light source. So in other words, creating light onto the scene. So when we're looking at um, uh, creating the blue light, the gel across all the background, you would think that the quickest way to do it would add a blue light to the actual um, uh, people in the background. In fact, it's not. It's to make sure that we turn our camera into tungsten mode and then use the CTO gel, the color temperature orange, on the main light source that's gonna light the skin tone, whether it's gonna be used with the likes of a honeycomb or a small snoot, just to control the light and control the spillage. So there's a minimal amount of white light within the scene to create the kind of photograph. So it's amazing what you can do with just two lights to create quite a dynamic look and feel in a place that you could never be able to really photo photograph. Session flow, this is the guy I was on about to you, the, uh, the auctioneer, uh, famous from Flog, Flog It. So again, when I'm looking at the session flow, I've got to work fast, so I'm looking for a key and a separation. We will need to actually be able to quickly move the key light um, so I can keep the shape and control onto the face for thinning and depth of detail. But all also where possible, I want to keep the separation lights into a minimum position so I can get the maximum variety in the least amount of time. So again, where camera positions rotate in rounds, different kind of shoots, different kind of accessories onto the front really change. Obviously, if you're looking for a little bit more of a dynamic light, like we see here, a little bit more Hollywood light, we need to actually control it with a snoot or a barn doors or a honeycomb. Um, and then the difference that uh, by high, hiding the background uh, often is best when it looks bad. So in these warehouses, if you've ever been to an, aw an auction room, looks great on television, and the reality is it doesn't look that great. Uh, um, so we need to either darken things or blow, blow things out. And obviously in an editorial style of image, I need to actually give uh, a reference to him and possibly the location at the same time uh, by just actually including it in within the scene shot itself. Quick posing, but no changing of the light positions here. And then we basically end up with a new location once more. Once more, we've got that key light running at the uh, four o'clock position, separation light, which is being used to actually light all the backgrounds. And of course, what I've got to look at as well, 
is if I didn't light this um, cupboard that is behind me, this would just be a black hole within the mirror. So I've got to look at the whole scene and actually light the whole scene, especially when mirrors are being used. So when I want to bring more dynamic to the image, overpower the ambient, make the light smaller like it is on the right hand side. When I need to give big light and big illumination, make the light as big as we can with either a bounce card or an umbrella or a big soft big soft softbox to allow the light to explode more. Then the last loca uh, location, this is this Ming vase that was just about to actually go up for sale. You reckon it was going to get close to I can't remember now, it was 100 grand, was it, or sort of thing? So you, I, I don't touch anything like that at that point, even though my insurance covers it. Um, but just, again, strong dynamic light. So you can see the image on the left-hand side. He's turned his head um, towards the uh, um, 7 or 8 o'clock position on the clock. I need him to move it back to where it should be. It's pointing towards the 5 to allow the separation light coming in from the 10 o'clock to do its job. And obviously, the key, the key light to bring some illumination to the shadow side of the face where it's being positioned at the 4 o'clock. Remember, there's, not all, all, uh, there's also a position for the height of the light. And really, the position of the height of the light is for the catch light in the eye. So what you're usually trying to create, if the light is coming in from the right-hand side, in other words, from the, the 3 to the 6 o'clock position, we're looking for a 2 o'clock catch light on the top of the eye. If the light is coming in from the 6 o'clock to the 9 o'clock position, we're looking for a 10 o'clock catch light on, on the eye. So you can see the quick variety there just allows us to bring it together. But that is um, probably a good half hour's worth of shoot, um, probably allowing an hour to get it done to move location, but minimizing and moving kit as fast as we can. But then you're in um, a location. This is uh, the restaurant that my son is head chef at in Bath. Um, basically, um, different managers come in for the rest at uh, the restaurant, sommeliers and so on. So I'm, I'm often there to actually shoot, uh, shoot with them. And here, of course, um, I've got just the one room. I've probably only got 10, 10 minutes to take the shots, so I need to maximize the variety so they can use it for social, for web, for, art, for articles, you, you name it. I need to shoot the maximum variety in the smallest space. So everything we're doing now, you're going to see within a 10-foot circumference of the camera position. The camera is only rotating in an anti-clockwise direction. It's not moving in any other way. So in the position then, then we move to uh, a slight anti-clockwise position to shoot through. We can see now the separation light is uh, being used on the right-hand image, but it's being switched off on the left-hand image. So still three lights, the key light, a separation to run down the arm. Okay, that's the first thing. Then a third light to either a light and illuminate the background or not. So this is the, diff the difference just being able to switch off the background light quickly from within the controller to make sure um, I I'm kind of just uh, getting that variety dynamic, low key on the left, mid key on the right. So just bring in some wine, then we just move um, or turn the camera position towards the bar getting that minimal light. So again, now the light that is lighting up the the glassware behind behind her was originally set to light behind her the wall. Okay, now it's just turned around in the opposite direction to light it. But because of the glassware, it needs to be turned down about a stop compared to what it would have done the other. Otherwise, we'd burn out that. The key light onto her. Um, basically, this is a two light setup rather than a three. Um, but we can get away with the three lights if. We wish or we could get away with the two lights. Depends exactly what we want to do. So what we just covered is metering, using the ambient, setting up your flash, manual versus T is TTL, creating color or creative color, I should say, shutter speed for effects and lighting recipes for session flow. Go, Jay. Yep, I've got some questions for you, pal. Two seconds. I was just answering one of the questions, but we're going to cover that in a second anyway. Um, Okay, so I'll read it as it says, daft question of the night, but no questions are daft. Uh, quite early on, you mentioned about metering through the camera. How do you do that? Um, well, when you point your camera towards, so we're, we're in manual mode, yes, on camera. We look through the actual lens. We point it towards the sky, 
and then basically you move your shutter speed up to say 125th first because you don't want to go too high with the shutter speed yet uh, even if you've got the control of high speed sync i would say move your shutter speed initially to 125th then change the aperture until your exposure dial is showing that it is the correct exposure well thank you mate um going back to the uh, Elvis impersonator shot with the the embroidery guy, uh, not embroidery, yep. upholstery guy. Sorry. Um, so let me just read it to you. Do you meter for every light when you take, um, like you do in the studio? On, oh, have I read that wrong? Two seconds. Sorry, hang on a minute. Do you meter for every light, like when you're in the studio, and how long does that take you? Does that makes minutes. And yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so if if you know that your key light is you need to the first thing is the ambient light source yeah so i meter it and go right so 15th at four i want to kill the ambient light by a stop i'm now at a third a 30th at four or a 15th at five six whichever way around you want to do it i always like to control the aperture that i want to shoot with so for editorial editorial the sun the sundays i need deep, deep detail so i'm working on 11s and 16s other editorial, there'll be shallow details, so I'm using two, eight, and four, a maximum of five, six. So the first thing is, I need to choose my aperture before anything. Then I've got to set the ambient light based on what it reads, combined with the triangle, the exposure triangle. So the only thing we didn't talk about today was ISO. And by design, I always want to have the lowest ISO I can, um, but obviously when I'm dealing with people, the last thing I want to do is use a second or two seconds or half a second exposure in case they wobble or move a little bit. And that if there's ambient light within the scene, we'll actually see that bit of blur. If we're completely obliterating any ambient light within the scene, I can use the likes of a, a two second expo exposure in a black room because the only thing that is going to be um, uh, lit is basically the subject with the flash that I'm popping on it. So we want to light meter that first. So once I've got my exposure correct with the exposure triangle, but by choosing the aperture, that's my key thing, then I can go ahead and actually decide on uh, the type of flash I want to light the subject with, its shape, its size, its softness, set that in place. That's the most important part. Then, in fact, go and put the other lights where I want them to be and give them the accessory that I need to spread or control the light again, and then basically decide exactly what we want to do. So if I'm using um, a meter, I can obviously go to the scene and actually, I know 5.6 is what I want the aperture to be, let's say, for my key light, which means my background light now needs to be controlled to F4. And that would just be me actually metering and then changing the exposure up or down, depends on what it's giving me out. You soon get used to the equipment that you use if you use it often enough. I still remember learning to drive and how the hell do you press, press a clutch, change a gear, release the clutch and accelerate at the same time. It's all that kind of thing. And once you do it for so long, it just becomes rhythm. And that's what you do. You arrive in a scene, you go, right, this is what I need to do. Check the exposure, set the exposure, put the key light in position, meter the key light, get that per perfect. Now set the other lights within the scene. Uh, Brill, you touched on there about um, accessories and modifiers, and that's the next question. Um, your views, do you, uh, so asking you for your views, parabolic modifiers compared to soft boxes, please. What do you prefer and why? Both. Both. Soft boxes because they can be small. Uh, parabolica because obviously I can create a different quality of light and the drop off is more significant. Cool. Uh, when do you measure um, between uh, reflective and incident? What, why, why do you do the two? Did you, I think you touched on that earlier, but maybe it's a recap, is it? Yeah, so basically I want a, 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 a more accurate re reading than an average one. So as a rule, when I do any workshops at all, my dome is out. It's the easiest way to do it. Plus most people, they're looking on the back of the screen and go, oh, that looks great. The reality is you get it back onto your monitor and you're going to see it's overexposed by about a 10 for two, 10 to the stop, depends exactly how you took the exposure reading. 
why I use the flat disc dial in the dome yeah is so that I can have a more accurate read, reading because I'm not interested in the average reading of the shadow that's my job with my fill light or the ambient light within the scene and that is a separate exposure um, how do you um, meter in a room that has different light levels within it choose the level that you're trying to expose for so if i had a spotlight on a stage am i trying to expose for the dark areas of the stage or the spot a spotlight that is illuminating an, a an area in the background that i want to control it would be looking at the background what's the interesting part what do i want to expose so in other words the sky is easy do i want to complement it or uh, to overpower it when you're in a scene like we've been seeing you basically go right this is where the eye is going to be going to that's what i'm going to meter for uh, that's all the questions mate with the exception of not particularly for you but we were asked by two or three people tonight uh, this is the first in the series that they've joined can we view the previous um webinars yes you can photographer academy no you can't i've stopped it i've completely <laughs> No, he hasn't because he has no say over that. I'm the boss there. Uh, yes, all of the um, previous parts are now online in the Photography Academy, and this one uh, will get converted over the weekend and be added to the site in a few days. Uh, which trigger system do you use for off-camera flash? Just come in from here. Okay, so there's been a whole host of it that I've used over the years. Some of it used to be very expensive, then it got very cheap because <laughs> all I wanted to do was go fire and then it became expensive again and it became cheap again and then it became built in. So if it's a speed light now, I can pretty much use the built in speed light um, receiver and trigger that is a part of the Yongnu system itself. <sighs> when I was using some of the old uh, Nikon and Canon flashes, I'd have to use initially a third par party wireless trigger because um, uh, originally flash didn't bend. In other words, it, it couldn't see the infrared around a corner. And if you've hidden a, uh, a flash in a biscuit tin, <laughs> it's never going to see it. So we'd always actually put radio receivers on it. Um, they're so cheap nowadays. I'd basically, I I'd get, okay, so that's the first thing. So the Yongnu built into the speed, uh, the speed light. Um, if Jay's given you the link to the Apprentice films, you'll see me using Cactus Flash then, because Cactus had brought out an amazing cheap system that allowed me to stick any speed light on top of, no matter how old it was, and control not only the trigger, but also the up and down power powering of the flash. So I, from um, camera position, I could change the exposure without visiting the flash again. Um, I'm not sure how much the cactus has improved. I, I, I don't know that because Yongnu became so cheap and so powerful and wi uh, wireless, I pretty much moved over to that straight away. However, when I'm using Speedlight and Elinchrom Flash together, I use the Elinchrom uh, Skyport 2 receive receivers to plug into the Speedlights. Yeah. Why? Because then I can work with all the Flash together in the same controller. The only thing the Elinchrom Skyport won't do is change the power of the Flash up and down, but it will tell it to fire. Uh, brilliant, mate. That is all of the questions done and dusted. So we're done. Thank you, everybody.